Hi, my name is Tom and welcome back to my channel. Today I wanted to do something slightly different if that's okay with all of you. Partly I wanted to test the waters for a new series that I'm thinking about working on, but also I needed a bit of a break having worked on a number of What the Theory and Politics videos recently, which can be very time intensive. So over the past couple of months I've been reading a lot. And I suppose in some senses I'm always reading a lot, I'm doing a PhD and reading a ridiculous amount of books and articles kind of comes with the territory. However, over the past couple of months I've been making a really conscious effort to read more fiction. Now this has certainly included some contemporary work, Anna Burns' Milkman being a particular highlight, however I've also been trying to have a crack at some of the quote-unquote classics. In fact, at the moment, I'm just under halfway through James Joyce's Ulysses. Now, to stress, this is something which is quite new to me. The canon of classic literature has always been something I've been quite aware of, but it's always seemed to be a little bit over there. And I think it feels like that to a lot of people. In my case, my PhD has one foot firmly in cultural studies, and thus I draw a lot of ideas from literary theory. Doing so has given me a passing acquaintance with the plots, themes and supposed significance of a number of different texts. However, there's always been this kind of mental barrier which has always stopped me from, you know, actually going out and reading them. All this to say I'm not a natural reader, particularly of this kind of work, but gradually that seems to be changing. I suppose what's often put me off reading the classics is this notion that it would be an awful lot of work that I'd spend my entire time analysing rather than simply reading for enjoyment and that at best it would be kind of type 2 fun. The more I've read, however, the more I found this not to be the case. When I first set out to read Middlemarch, for example, I did so with this notion that I might draw upon what it reveals about the political and social geography of early 19th century Britain within my PhD. Increasingly, however, though, I found myself just enjoying it, enjoying Eliot's witty humour, her wry style and her brilliant sarcasm. In fact, the notion that I was going to draw upon at my PhD gradually fell away, but I carried on reading it, simply because I wanted to spend more time with Eliot and with the brilliant eccentric characters she creates. And throughout this short journey I've been so far, I've come to really value a decent contemporary introduction to the book that I'm about to read. A short, less than chapter length primer on the historical context, perhaps an introduction to the particular style of the author, and maybe a suggestion as to why others deem this book to be so significant, to really prepare me just for reading that book. As I've done so, however, I found that not all introductions are quite the same. Some are so assured of the brilliance of the author that they end up just being downright patronising to the potential reader. Others are so interested in the nuances of very particular words or phrases that they lose sight of the fact that when you first go to read a book, you probably just want to take in the plot and absorb some of the themes rather than obsess over particular words. I read one introduction to James Joyce's The Portrait of an Artist as a Young Man, which made me question whether I actually wanted to read the book at all. So, if it seems like the kind of thing which might be well received, I'm quite keen to put together a series which provides some fun and accessible introductions to some classic novels and texts. In particular, I'd be really interested in creating videos which provide the viewer with that kind of historical, social and artistic context to allow them to really enjoy those books. If that seems like something which might be of interest, then do let me know down in the comments. Equally, if it doesn't, then, then tell me, that is useful to know. For the rest of today's video, however, I wanted to talk a little bit more generally about some of the strategies and approaches that I found really helpful in removing some of the baggage that comes with reading classic literature. A few tips which I found have really helped me feel capable of approaching this work and allowed me to find real joy in doing so. 
So, because we tend to do things in lists of five on the internet, uh, here is a list of five tips for reading classic books. Number one, some context is essential. Too much is fatal. So, as I've mentioned, finding a good, snappy, engaging introduction to a book that you want to read can be a really great way of bridging the temporal gap which often exists between us and the author of a piece of classic literature. As I've been reading Ulysses, for example, it's been really useful to have some awareness of how the cause for Irish independence from Britain was progressing at that time. Having that little bit of knowledge has allowed me to understand some actions or behaviours which might have seemed strange otherwise, but also it's allowed me access to a lot of the jokes and humour and imagery within there that otherwise might have been a bit lost on me. Getting a good grasp of some of this stuff ahead of time, I found means that I very rarely have to put the book down and start googling some stuff, but also it's made it much more rewarding. Because I've just got that little bit of background contextual information, it's been me that's made connections between uh, certain characters and certain motifs and certain historical events, and that's really rewarding. It makes me feel really smug when I spot something like that. That being said, too much of this kind of information information can be stifling. I mean, you don't want to have to read three history books just to read one novel, and for the most part, you don't have to. A good introduction should give you just enough information that you have a broad understanding of the world in which this author and these characters are existing, so you can set aside those worries about the temporal gap and just enjoy the action that is taking place within that book. Number two, in some books you won't understand everything, and that's cool. So the way that we approached literature when I was at school was that we'd usually have one or two key excerpts that we'd focus on over a series of months sometimes, analysing them within an inch of their life. And I think the lasting impression that's given me is that to simply read Romeo and Juliet, say, you have to understand every single possible nuanced understanding of every single line that is uttered. And this just isn't the case. Coming to terms with the fact that some books, either due to age or stylistic approach, will have perhaps entire passages that are almost entirely indecipherable to some of us, me included, is a really healthy thing to acknowledge. I've currently got Beowulf on my shelf to read, and I'm sure there are going to be lots of bits in that which are going to seem quite distant from my experience and thus tough to understand. However, while it is amazing if you understand every single word of a book, often if you can't quite work out where what an author's getting at within a certain paragraph, it's not necessarily fatal to you understanding the rest of the book. My suggestion then would not necessarily be to skip over it, but to sort of persevere through any tough passages and be assured that most probably at some point the author's going to turn a corner and you'll find yourself back on slightly more solid ground. Number three, make sure to find a good edition. Now, this is particularly important if, like me, you're embracing the trends of 2005 and are mostly reading on an e-reader. Some people love having physical books, they like the feel of the pages and having that physical object. I'm quite indifferent and a bit of a cheapskate, so I've mostly been finding the books that I've been reading on Project Gutenberg, which I'll link down below. The danger here is that the quality of ebooks on some sites can vary wildly. Apple's bookstore, for example, has a number of different uh, editions of different books which are just quite badly formatted and seem to just be a copy and paste job, where someone's then just uploaded it to the store. In addition to this, with many older books and also any books which have been translated into English, whatever language you want to read in, there's often numerous different uh, editions and versions. And I think it's really worth seeking out one which other people seem to have responded to well. Number four, remember that the canon is a construction. This is a broader point which I'll probably make an entire episode of What the Theory about at some point in the near future, and that is that the canon is a construction. It's what Raymond Williams refers to as a selective tradition in which certain authors and works are included and others excluded to various political and powerful ends. So treat any list of classic literature with caution and try to remain aware of that. 
also know that it is entirely valid to not think a piece of classic literature is good. That doesn't mean you've not understood it. You might genuinely have uh, understood all of it and just not think it's that remarkable. Number five, remember that these books were meant to be read. Both Joyce and Eliot are, in their own ways, absolutely hilarious. They want to entertain us as much as they want to make us think or introduce us to deep philosophical ideas. Nevertheless, the way that we often discuss the classics lends itself to giving them this kind of baggage. And I think it's often easy to fall into that trap of viewing, reading some of these books as almost uh, an academic exercise rather than an enjoyable one. Sometimes I'll be reading Dickens, say, and stumble across a passage which I find genuinely really amusing, and I'll be shocked by that. And that really shouldn't be the case. In fact, when the novel first started to gain traction in society, many serious intellectual types decried it as being overly emotional and sentimental. Try to embrace this fact. And remember that these books were not written as artefacts, but as living, breathing, human stories. So I hope some of these tips have been useful to you if, like me, you're attempting to get a few more classic bits of literature under your belt. Mostly I hope it just helps to shake off some of the baggage that often comes with reading this kind of work. As I've said above, if that idea of making a series of introductions to some classic works of literature seems interesting or useful, then please do let me know down below in the comments. And if you've enjoyed this particular video, then consider giving it a thumbs up and subscribing if you haven't already. Thank you very much for watching once again and have a great week.